All right, why don't you take out those notes you got when you came in today. We are a note-taking church. And I, I'm bringing some messages that are from a season that I had of prayer and really spending some time with the Lord. And he gave me some messages that I think are helpful to your life. And we've been talking about different topics every single week to build your faith. In today's message, I simply titled this, and I want you to write it down. It's simply, Why Try Again? Why Try Again? I really believe the Lord has given me a word to encourage some people who are just frustrated. You're thrown, you've threw in the towel. You're just kind of like at a place where you feel like there's not even a point of trying again. And my challenge for you is to just get new faith to believe God for the miraculous. And I, I just a firm believer that maybe your miracles on the next side of the movement that you make. And today will be that message, that time to just challenge you to try again. We've all gotten that point where we just don't wanna try again. I think of things in my life that I've kind of given up on. I remember about a year ago, I did my very first and my very last marathon that I'll ever do. And I remember I finished the, uh, the marathon and when I got done, I got text messages immediately where people were like, Aaron, are you ever gonna do that again? And I'm like, there's no way in the world I'm ever signing up for one of those things again. It was one and done, I'm finished, I'm over it. We were talking about this with my kids last night and we were talking about how we like to, the kids love to go tubing behind boats and they're like, well, daddy, why don't you ever get on the tube? And I said, because I don't trust anybody with my life that way. I'm almost 40 years old. I'm not gonna get on a tube behind a boat and, and, and hurt myself. I'm just over, I don't, I don't need to try that. Again, I made a whole list of it. I'll never try rock climbing again, I'm over that. I'm done with skydiving, you're not gonna ever see me doing that. I'm not gonna eat liver. I know people say it's healthy, I'm over it. I've just made up my mind. And that's fine when it comes to some of your hobbies, when it comes to maybe even some food and some things in your life. But what happens when it comes to your area of faith? What happens when it comes to your walk with God? Or maybe when it, what happens when it comes to reading the scriptures or diving in and getting involved in your church? What happens when it comes to a relationship that's broken and, and you've tried and you don't, you don't see it working anymore? What it happens when it's that marriage and you went to counseling and it just didn't work? What happens when it's that child that has walked away from the faith and, and you've tried to reach out and it's just not working anymore? Why try Again, and I wanna challenge you with this because I wanna get you some grit in your faith, a little bit of grit to just believe that God can honor our ability to try again, even when we haven't seen the results yet. I'm trying to teach this to my kids when it comes to life. I'm just like, hey, you gotta try again. You gotta kinda make some things happen. And if you ever, uh, if you have kids, you understand how they give up really easily. So I'm like, hey, did you brush your teeth today? No, I didn't. Why didn't you brush it? I couldn't find my toothbrush. Well, did you look? Yeah, yeah, I looked, it wasn't on the counter. Well, did you open a drawer? Like any drawer, did you open them? Did you look inside of a drawer? And, and, and no, I looked at a drawer, it's not there. Did you look on the ground? Is it on the ground? Is it in one of the other bathrooms? Did you just try, did you, did you grab your sibling's toothbrush? Can you use that one? Like just, just make it happen. Make it happen. And I wonder if you got a little bit of grit in your spirit to go, you know what? I might have tried once and it didn't work, but I'm gonna believe God again. I'm gonna trust God again. I'm gonna go after it yet again. I'm gonna believe that even if I've tried before and it hasn't worked, I'm gonna believe that God can still do a miracle in my life. Can I hear a good amen today, church? It's possible. And by the way, this kind of grit, this kind of drive and perseverance is what is needed to actually excel and succeed in the world today. They did a study on what employers want most in an employee, and they, they compared it, the top five qualities. And what was interesting is 10 years ago, the number one quality that an employer wanted was hard work ethic from their employee. And it switched over the last year, mostly coming through COVID, coming through the season that we were in. And when it switched, when they did it, they go the top, um, they, they did the top five, and I actually put them on the screen. People like these kind of lists. So here's the most recent things that an employer wants an employee. And by the way, the number one one is now number three. And the number one uh, desire of an employer is that they have critical thinking and look at this, problem solving. Like, don't let us do your job for you. 
Figure some stuff out. And if it doesn't work, by the way, try it a different way. Try it a different way. Try it a different way. And by the way, you want to see yourself get promoted a lot? Then learn how to make things happen when nobody else can make them happen. And all the uh, bosses say, yeah, amen, right? You got to learn how to make some stuff happen. And in a world that is so unpredictable and frustrating, I think there's a grit that comes in our faith to say, we're not going to give up just because we haven't seen the results yet. We're going we're gonna to drive forward because we know how good God is and we know what's possible with our God. We're not going to settle short for what God can do in our life. So I'm going to show it to you in a story in the Old Testament that is so significant. And it's a story of a guy by the name of Elisha. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there. Second Kings, we're in chapter 4. And we're looking at this guy, Elisha who was the successor of the kind of the OG prophet. His name was Elijah. And Elijah raises up Elisha. And as he raises him up, Elisha does these incredible miracles all over that area of the world. And one of the miracles is there was a lady who was was very wealthy, her and her husband, and they ended up doing something, uh, helping Elisha out. And Elisha, when they helped him out, they said, Elisha says, what do you want? I'll give you anything. And they said, we've been praying for a child. We've been kind of shunned by society because we haven't had children. Will you give us a child? Well, Elisha says, in a year from now, you'll have a child. The story goes that they gave her this child. Now the child is raised up and we pick up in the story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18. It's right there in your notes, but it's also on the screen. Look what it says. It says, the child grew and one day he went out to his father who was with the reapers and he said to his father, my head my head. He's having this moment where, where there's something going on. And the father responded in a way that all dads respond. Look what it says in the next verse. His father told a servant, carry him to his <laughs> mother. Come on. Come on, dads. We know that's the case. They have, they have a problem. Like, Go talk to your mom about this. We don't know what to do. It says, carry, carry him to his mother. And after the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, The boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. Then he died. What do you do when the miracle that you've been given starts to die? What do you do when that that child that you once prayed for walks away from the faith? What do you do with that, that marriage? That marriage was a miracle. It was a miracle God gave you that. And then it starts to fall apart. What do you do when you, you, got that, you got into that school? You should have never got into that school and you got in, but then now you're overwhelmed with anxiety and worry. What do you do when the miracle starts to die? That's what was happening to the miracle. This boy starts to die and he dies on his mother lap, lap and you can f- imagine the frustration and you can imagine the anger. And so what does she do? She runs back to the man of God. She's like, Elisha, you're going to fix this thing. You're the one that gave him to me. You're the one that'll fix it. Which, by the way, some encouragement for you. If God brings a miracle into your life, when the miracle starts to suffer, go to the Lord. He's the one that started it. He's the one that can sustain it. And by the way, he's the one that can resurrect it. Can we give him some praise? He's the God that'll take care of whatever even miracles we've been given. So look what she does. She reached the man of God on the mountain. She took hold of his feet. And Gehazi came over and pushed her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. I really felt this message is for some people today who are in bitter distress. You're just sitting there going, I just can't figure out why it's happening the way it's happening. I'm in bitter distress. The Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. And look what she complains to him. Did I not, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes. Like, like you got my hopes up about this thing. And she's majorly disappointed. Elisha says to Gehazi, look at this. Tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. And don't greet anyone you meet. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. That's like every introvert when they try to walk into Radiant. Isn't it? <laughs> but they don't allow you, right? They just take over and they're like, we're just glad you're here. Here's the first attempt. Look what he does. He says, lay my staff on the boy's face. And what does he do? Gehazi went on ahead and he laid the staff on the boy's face and the boy 
was raised back to life. Is that what it says? Come on, help me out today, church. Is that what it says? No. No, no there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy is not awakened. So Elisha says, well, I guess that's it. We tried one time. God's not going to do the miracle. But if so many of your lives, if the story was written, it would be, I tried one time and it didn't work. I believed God. I did what I knew to do. It didn't work. But Elisha won't take no for an answer. I love it. So he goes in and says, and Elisha reaches the house. So now, first he sent a servant. Now he shows up at the house. And the boy was lying dead on the couch. He went in, he shut the door on two of them, and he prayed to the Lord. Now, we don't know how long verse 34 is from verse 30, verse 33 versus verse 34. It could have been hours. It could have been days. There is a moment where he's praying and he's praying and he's praying. And you know what's happening that he can see? Nothing, nothing. And there's going to be seasons in your life that you're praying and you don't think anything is happening. But while you're praying, God's working the miracle behind the scenes. Our prayers are never in vain. But he thought it was. He goes, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And then finally it clicks. I should probably do something about this. I should probably take matters in my own hands. Somehow I should probably do some act of faith to see this miracle happen. And he goes in verse 34. When he got on the bed, he lays on the boy. Now this gets weird. Mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And he stretched himself out on the boys. And the boy's body grew warm. Verse 35, Elisha turned away and walked back and forth. I'll picture this. He's in this room alone. He lays on this boy. Okay, this is going to make it happen. Doesn't happen. Now he's walking back and forth. Isn't that a picture of so many of our lives? We're going to figure this thing out. We're going to figure this thing out. I'm glad he's walking back and forth instead of walking out of the door going, well, I guess it's just not going to happen. There's a moment where you got to go back and forth and go, okay, God, how are you going to make this miracle happen? How are you going to do it? I've been praying for that lost neighbor for years and years and years. I've been praying, but God, now you're going to show me how to make the miracle happen in their life. You're going to show me what to send. We're going to get this thing because we're going to keep trying until we see the miracle. And he walks back and forth and look at it says in the room and he got on the bed and he stretched out on him once more. Can you say once more? Oh, help me at all of our campuses say once more. more. And this is my whole desire today is that today would be your once more. Your once more. And as he did it once more, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. What do we do when the miracle doesn't happen the first time? Here's what I've realized is when the miracle doesn't happen the first time, it takes faith to keep trying. And I want to raise your level of faith to just keep trying. And some of you, you've given and you haven't seen the miracle in your finances. Keep trying. Some of you, you went to counseling and, 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 and it didn't work. Keep trying. Some of you, you, you've spoke those scriptures over your kids and they're still not following the Lord. Keep trying. I want to challenge you in this, that we're going to have an I'm not going to quit attitude because I'm believing that as long as God's speaking and God's moving, then there's still hope for my circumstance and we're going to see miracles in our life. We're going to believe it. So why do we try again? Three things. I want you to write them down and I think they'll help you from our story today. Why do we try again? Because if God has done a miracle in the past, he can do one in the present. Elisha is a man that saw miracle after miracle after miracle. And even in this story, the boy who dies was a miracle. He was a boy that wasn't even supposed to be there, but the parents conceived in an old age after being barren for years and years and years. It was a miracle that he had seen with his own eyes. And Elisha had to have a moment where he's sitting there looking at this boy that's dead going, this was once a miracle. And I don't know, the situation might have changed, but God didn't change. And if God didn't change, then he who started the work is faithful to complete the work and he will finish the work because that's who our Jesus is. Remember, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me say it this way. You have not reached your quota for the miracles God can do in your life. There is more possible in your life. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what is possible for those who believe God. So we've got to get our faith up to believe that if God's done anything in your past, 
And I just want you to think about it because we talk ourselves into like, there's no way this miracle is going to happen. But you got to look backwards sometimes. I love the Psalms. You go through the Psalms so many times. He said, I remember the goodness of God. I remember the goodness of God. I remember. You know why David had to tell himself? Because it's easy to forget it. And we can get blinded by the immediate issue and go, it's never going to work out. Well, it worked out a month ago. It worked out a year ago. And you got to look back. I look back on my life. Every time I face an obstacle, I go, oh, but God, you did it back then. You did it back then. Oh, then he brought, brought that child. Oh, I didn't deserve that. He gave me that wife. I definitely didn't deserve that one. Gave me this church. He's healed my body before. You look back on the miracles you've experienced and those miracles in the past build your faith to go, God can do it in the present also. So why am I gonna keep trying? I'm gonna keep trying because God's been faithful in my past. And you could be in here today and at one of our locations and go, Aaron, I've never seen God do a single miracle in my life and you would be a liar. And you know why? Because simply the fact that you're saved, you've experienced the greatest miracle known to man today. There is no greater miracle than the miracle of salvation of a person's soul. You gotta think about this. We are dead in our sins, separated from God, and there's no hope for us. The Bible actually tells us we're deserving of the wrath of God. And at that moment, Jesus came and he lived a sinless life. He died a horrific death for your sins and for mine, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again three days later. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. And when he overcame that, he now ascended to the right hand of the Father. He sent us his Holy Spirit, who now the Holy Spirit, who draws us to salvation. So you're dead in your sins. The Holy Spirit goes and draws you when you don't even deserve it. And now you just have to submit. And you threw that hand up on one Sunday at Radiant and you said, I'm gonna give Jesus my life. I'm submitting as the Holy Spirit was drawing you. And then you get this amazing experience called you become born again. Like you get a whole fresh start. The actual biblical term is justification. I mean, it's just as if you had never sinned before. You get a hundred percent fresh start right there because of what Jesus did on the cross. And you had that moment. You were going from an eternity in hell to an eternity in heaven in a split second because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. You don't tell me you haven't experienced a miracle. There's no miracle greater than the miracle of salvation. The Puritans used to say it this way, the miracle of us dying and going to heaven when we die is actually not as big of a miracle as the miracle that we've experienced on earth from going dead in our sins to alive in Christ. So the simple fact that one day you will go into heaven one day, you go, that's gonna be crazy. That itself is not as big as the miracle that happened when you gave your life to Christ because our soul was totally transformed because of what Jesus did. Like if we, if we knew how big of a miracle it took to save us eternally, we would never doubt God's ability to meet our needs daily. And if you understood how great salvation was from your sins, then you wouldn't ever doubt if the fact that God can save you from whatever situation you're in right now. The same Jesus that saved you then can save your situation now. He's a miracle worker. Can we give him some praise today, church? Number two, why do I keep trying again? Here's the second one. It's because if God used their life, he can use my life. He can use my life. And I love this because we have to understand that God is no respecter of persons. You do not have a subpar experience with a junior Holy Spirit. You have the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that empowered the apostles, that led our church fathers and mothers, and the heroes of the faith were empowered by this spirit that's the same spirit that lives in your life. You are not an exception to this. You are part of the process of the people of God that have power to walk in the miraculous. That's good news for us. And Elisha knew this. He looked at his life and goes, listen, if God used Elijah, his spiritual father, then God can use me. Look at these stories. Look at this. All right. Getting away from my notes, but it's fun. All right. 
Elisha, Elijah, this is this, the, this, the spiritual father of Elisha. This is the one that trained him up. He stopped rain. He multiplied oil. He brought a boy back to life. He called down rain. He called down fire. He uh, splits the Jordan. Okay, that's six of his miracles. And when you read Elisha's story, he replicated all six of those miracles in his life. Like Elisha was incredible, but he's totally unoriginal. (laughs) Because you know what he's doing? He's just going, well, if God did it through Elijah that way, he can do it through my life that way. Like I want, I want faith to believe that if God can use people to change the world and raise the dead, that God can do it in my life also. All right, Elijah has a story in, his, in, the, in the book of 1 Kings where it talks about a widow's son that dies. This is gonna blow your mind. Ready? I, I love the Bible. It's so rich. Look at this. 1 Kings 17, 19. This is Elijah's response to the son that died. Not Elisha, not the one we've already been talking about. This is his spiritual father, the one that raised him up. Elijah says, give me your son. And he took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord. He prays, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy on even this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then look at verse 21. He stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. Do you know what he did? He did this whole thing, he stretched out and the boy came back to life. And then years later, Elisha is in a room with a boy that's dead. He's praying, walking back and forth going, God, what do I do? God, what do I do? Well, I know what, what Elijah taught me to do. You lay on the person and they come back to life. Sounds irrational, but it brought the impossible. Elisha knew something that I want you to know. If God can use their life, he can use your life. When Radiant, when we were, when we were called to start the church, we didn't know what to do. So Katie and I went to a church like planter training. It's like where you start a church. You didn't even realize those things exist. They exist. And we went to Alabama to learn. And they were like heroes of the faith that were putting this thing on. They were like, you know, people that have built these unbelievable churches that have changed the world. And I remember meeting these people like for the first time. I, you know, I was 28, 29 years old. I had no clue what to do. We just knew we wanted to move to Tampa and start a church. And I remember meeting them. And so I was there to like glean wisdom. Can I give you the big takeaway? I've never told this in 10 years. Never felt I was able to tell it in 10 years. But while they were talking to me, I was taking all their notes. You know, oh, wow, you do that? Oh, okay, you, you build the team this way. Oh, you handle finances this way. Okay, I'm taking notes. Here was my number one takeaway from meeting these great heroes, men and women of faith. Man, they're not that remarkable. I'm smiling. Wow. I turned to Katie and be like, they're not special. They were way better on TV, weren't they? That's pretty crazy. And I wasn't dishonoring. I was, it was shocking how normal they were. And I left so encouraged. And I was like, God, I think I'm like, not great, but they're not either. And if God, if you can use them, I think you can use me. And I just left so encouraged. And then the craziest thing happens now. Now we have churches almost every weekend, I think we even have some this weekend, that will visit our church and they'll learn kind of the behind the scenes and, and they'll meet with me. They'll meet in my office and I, I see them now and they're taking notes while I'm talking and they're smiling and looking at me and I know what they're thinking. They're going, he's not that remarkable. Because God doesn't do miracles through our lives because we are great, but because he's great. Let me say it again. God doesn't do miracles through our lives because we are great, but because he is great. So if you ever try to disqualify yourself because of who you are, you've missed who the miracle worker is. It's not about you, it's about him. 
It's not about how awesome we are. It's about how awesome he is. It's not if we're sufficient. It's that he is more than sufficient to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask, think, or imagine. That is what our God does. And here's the fact. God isn't looking for ability. He's actually just looking for availability. So I'm not the most qualified. I'm just the most available. Like just, I'm here, I'm here. And there was probably, I really believe there's probably a lot more qualified people God brought to Tampa before me (laughs) or called, but they just didn't say yes. I just said yes. And maybe there's a lot more qualified people to see your neighbor come to know the Lord or to see that child come back to faith or to see that business built for God's kingdom. And you go, well, I'm not qualified. It's not about you being qualified. It's about you being available. And God's just waiting for you to say, I'm available. I love it when he called um, Isaiah, he goes, whom shall I send? He didn't say who is qualified enough. He said, whom will go? And uh, and, uh, Isaiah just said, here I am, send me. He didn't say, here I am. Here's my pedigree of how I'm available, how awesome I am. I'm just, I'm just available. Telling you, God can use our life when we get available. Are y'all still with me today, church? Yes. So why do I keep trying? Because I just see how God's used other people's lives and I just, I'm, I, I'm crazy enough to believe that he can do it in my life too. So I'm gonna keep trying. Number three, let's close out with this passage. Elisha reaches the house and the boy was laying dead on the couch. He went in, he shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. I want you to see this progression. He prays to the Lord. Then he got on the bed, he laid on the boy, stretched himself out, the, the uh, body grew warm, so there's some improvement, but it's not great. And I think many times <laughs> what we would do with our life is if, if we were in Elisha's shoes, when the body grew warm, we'd sit there and go, really God, that's all you have? I prayed for the boy to come back alive and you make his body a little warm. You really think that's what I was praying for? And you didn't see, because you're focused on perfection, but God's really working through you in process and progress. And he's doing step by step. You want to jump to the finish line, but I've realized the miracles with God don't work out that way. They're, they're normally step by step. And what did he do? He didn't get discouraged. He, Elisha, he turned away and he walked back and forth in the room. Then he got on the boy once more. And then what happens? The boy sneezes seven times and opens his eyes. And you look at that and I see it all throughout scripture. Here's number three. Why do I try again? Because most of God's greatest miracles are not immediate. They're incremental. And God does it little by little, step by step prayer by prayer. And if you can keep yourself from getting discouraged with the small progress, actually the Bible says it this way, do not despise the days of small beginnings. And I would say that in your own spiritual life, small breakthroughs are not to discourage you, they're to encourage you that he who began the good work can complete the work in your life. He's in the process with you working it through, just don't quit along the way. So what do we do? When we're praying and we're seeing a little bit of breakthrough, a little bit, but we're not seeing the victory yet, here's what I've learned, ready? Stop asking God if he will do the miracle, but ask God how he will do the miracle. And that's what Elisha did. He had a moment going, God, I know you wanna do this. How do you want it to happen? Many of you are asking God to do the miracle in your finances, but your prayer is God bless my finances and it should change to God, how do you wanna bless my finances? God, heal my marriage. And it needs to change to God, what do I need to do for you to heal my marriage? God, bring these kids back to the faith. The prayer should change to, God, how do you wanna bring my children back to the faith? What can I do? Do you understand? It's a place of going, I'm gonna get some grit to believe God that he can use my life and he's not just gonna give some genie in the bottle answer, he's gonna give me a strategy that while I walk out the strategy, it's gonna build my faith. God's gonna move along the whole scenario. And here's what I've learned, last last little takeaway, ready? It's that most people 
will never experience the big miracles because they aren't grateful for the little miracles along the way. And if you don't learn how to celebrate the small miracles along the way, you'll get discouraged and you'll eventually quit and you'll miss out on the big miracle that God had coming for you. So we celebrate the little ones. The body grew warm. And I can't imagine as Elisha's in that room and the body grows warm and, and he's starting to go, whoa, God, you're up to something. You're up to something. It's not perfect yet, but you're up to something. Can I just prophesy, prophesy it over some of your life today? It's not perfect yet, but God's up to something. I know, I know it's not been resurrected yet, but the body is getting warm. I know the person hasn't come to the faith yet, but I'm telling you, their heart's getting softened. God is up to something. And how do we have hope in this? Hebrews 10 says it this way. Let us hold unswervedly. I love that to the hope we profess. Ooh, let me tell you what that hope is. That hope is in Jesus, in Jesus. So it's not in our ability, it's in his ability. It's not in our work, it's in his work. You see, our work is only something significant because it shows a demonstration of faith. So when people say, are you really gonna keep trying that? Yeah, it's just my way of demonstrating faith that I'm gonna believe God for a miracle. Because we know our natural can't produce the supernatural, but our natural combined with a supernatural God breaks way for the supernatural in our life. So I don't know what you're believing for. I don't know what you're trusting for, but I want you to know, believe for the small miracles along the way. Our South Tampa location is such a good example of this. We've been praying for 10 years now that God would give us property in South Tampa, property, I'm praying for it. By the way, if you have property in South Tampa and you wanna give it to us, please talk to me after. I'll take you to lunch. Come on, McDonald's on me. It's cheap, but you got the idea. And uh, I've been praying for it for 10 years now. And you know how the miracles looked? You know, it started with 190 seat in a Britain theater and a dirty rundown dollar theater. And the miracle looked like us praying out, God, give us property, give us, we need to expand. And then the theater owner was like, oh, well, I can give you another theater on Sunday so y'all can stream into different camp. Okay. It looked different than the way I planned. So they were in two different theaters. There was about a year or two where I was bouncing back and forth between the theaters, preaching between services. It was crazy. And then there was about a year or so in, I was sitting in this area right over here watching uh, The Fast and the Furious. And this is a movie theater, it used to be. And I was looking at, there was a 45 foot wall that was in between the two auditoriums in the back here. And I remember going, God, you've got to give us property. You got it. And, and I just looked at the wall. I was like, I wonder if I can just tear that wall down. And without asking for permission, I just, no, I didn't. I asked for permission. <laughs> got a hammer. It was, it was the story of Elisha. It's God, you're going to do the miracle, but how do you want to make it happen? Then we got the first half of this building up here. And then we eventually took over the lease and we busted out that back section and then we busted out another back section and now we're still out of space, obviously. It's a crazy scenario. And every time I do, I go, God, what's the miracle you wanna do? And God opens up another building and opens up another thing. It didn't look the way I wanted to look, but I'm telling you, it's small miracles along the way to the big miracle God wants to do. And if he's done it in my life, he's no respecter of persons. He'll do it in your life. He'll do it in your family. He'll do it in your health. He'll do it in your spiritual walk. He's a God of the miraculous. You just gotta try again. Can we stand to our feet across all of Tampa Bay? I wanna leave just a couple minutes for us to worship, for us to submit ourselves. Remember, you're not trying to give God your resume of how great you are. You're trying to submit your need to the one who is so great and so amazing. So here's the question I wanna ask you today, is what have you given up on? <laughs> what is it that you need to try again? And you go, well, Aaron, I can't do it. It's not about you. It's about you enacting your faith to go, God, I'm gonna keep trying until you bring that miracle in. I'm gonna keep believing. And I believe as we submit ourselves to him, he's the God that'll do the miracle. Can we do it right now? Lord, we submit ourselves across Tampa Bay to the one who is able to do more than we can ask, think, or imagine. So I pray, Lord, that you would give us a grace to keep trying. Give us a grace to keep leaning in, to keep believing you. When it seems difficult and when it seems frustrating, we choose to trust 
God. We will try again because we trust the God that can make miracles happen. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let's have a moment right now. Come on, let's worship together all across Tampa Bay. Here's what I want to pray. I'm going to pray over two things over your life right now. Lord, give us the grace to try again. Give us the empowerment, the strength to try again. Lord, when we feel like, man, we're just weary, we're tired. God, we, we, we get that strength from you. We can't do it in our own power. We need you. Lord, and we don't just pray for the miracle to happen. We pray, how do you want the miracle to happen? God, release your spirit to bring strength and release your spirit to get strategy. Both of them are needed so that we can see that miracle in our life. Come on, believe it over yourself right now. God, your spirit for strength and not your spirit for strategy. I need both of them to do what you called me to do. In Jesus' name. One last group with eyes closed, heads bowed are those who, who have not experienced the greatest miracle ever given to mankind, which is the miracle of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you haven't made that decision, today's your day to surrender your life to Christ. You feel the spirit drawing you. You know you can't do it on your own. This is your moment to go all in with Christ. And if that's you on the count of three, I want you to throw that hand up, wave it at me and say, today's my day, Aaron, I'm surrendering. I've got issues, I've got sin, but I'm, I know I'm gonna give them to Jesus. And that one decision will change your life for all of eternity. That's when you experience total life change. When that hand goes up, you're gonna confess it with your mouth and God's gonna save you right there in your seat. No matter what campus you're at, this is your moment. On the count of three, ready? One, be bold, this is your day. Two, three, if that's you, come on, throw that hand up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, dozens all over this place. Thank you, thank you. Wow, what a great day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all those at every campus. If you raise that hand, put it right back down. Let's all pray this prayer out loud together. Let me just say this, God saw that your hand raised, but now he's looking at your heart. And I want you to pray this prayer and mean it with your heart. Say it like this, say, dear Jesus, come on, say it loud, dear Jesus, today, I give you my life. I give you my sin. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving me a fresh start. For the rest of my life, I'm gonna follow you. You are my Lord and you are my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that believes and says, Come on, let's celebrate those who just made the best decision ever.